Dear Church, dear family of Emmanuel Church, Bangalore, it's such a joy to come into the presence of the Almighty God. A new month, a new week for Sunday of the month, a joyful remembrance of God's goodness in each one of our lives. What a blessing. The Word of God very clearly reminds us, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Father, we are so grateful that you have encircled, enriched our lives with great and wonderful living promises. With joy full of adoration, thanksgiving, we bow down to worship you this morning. Be with us as you promised. Lead us as we continue to seek your face. Shall we look to the Lord in prayer? Father, in the name of the mighty name of Jesus, we worship you, adore you, and magnify you for who you are. Lord, the very fact that you have sustained each one of us marvelously through this past seven months of uncertainty makes us glad to give thanks and to worship you in the beauty of holiness. What shall we say? The Lord has been our good shepherd. He has been our savior, our redeemer. And our only hope, a living God who walks with us, talks with us. Thank you for what you're going to do even in this service this morning that you would minister to each one of us even as your children are gathering in their respective homes looking unto you from whence cometh our help O Lord most high the holy God and Savior our worship our adoration, our thanksgiving, and our gratitude would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight this morning. Lead us, fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Would you please turn with me in your hymnals, fairest of, of Lord Jesus. Jesus shines pure. 
than all the angels have can We are here to praise you Lift our hearts and sing. We are yet to give you the best that we can bring. And it is our love rising from our and mind and build that say I love you Lord Would you please sing with me once again We are here to praise you Lift our hearts and sing We are here to give you The best that we can Allah rising from our heart everything within us cries Abba Father help us now to give you pleasure and delight
in all the earth. Glorify your name. Glorify your name. Glorify your name in all the again with gladness. recognize there is none for us we are in a desperate situation we need your grace and your comfort Lord we need you so very much without you we cannot do anything and we just want to say thank you for encouraging us through this wonderful promise you are a faithful God when everyone fails you continue to remain faithful and so we would be able to say thank you Lord and declare you are my rock in times of trouble you lift me up when I fall down all through the storm your love is our anchor our hope is in you alone
dear church and the family of God. Slowly, we seem to be recovering from what had taken place for the past seven months. And the Lord has been blessing the ministry through the streaming and through the dedicated people. We need to be prayerful and thankful to them. And also, please be kind enough to join a time of prayer on Wednesdays from 7 o'clock to 8.15. It will be a great time of interceding for the people in and around us. You know the situation. It, can, it doesn't have to be explained. The Lord will give you the direction how to go about. Let's depend on God. Shall we look to the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father and our gracious God, with thankful hearts and in gratitude, we bow down this morning as individuals and as families and as a congregation of this local assembly to worship you, to adore you, to magnify you for thou art great and continues to do wonderful things. The very fact that you have so mercifully sustained us itself is a clear testimony of God's faithfulness. Father, thank you for yet another opportunity to kneel before you and to rejoice and to worship in the beauty of holiness. Lord, you are great and greatly to be praised. Gracious Father, thank you once again for this blessed day. Lord, thank you for caring about our future. You remain faithful to your people and restore to us the inheritance that you have promised. Lord, we rely on this promise that you will deliver us and protect us under your wings from all the dangers, even in the days to come. Lord, thank you for your promises and thank you for the assurance which never fails. For you are the Lord, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Father, we, are, we find so comfortable under your watchful care. Thank you for encircling, enriching our lives with great and wonderful living promises that assures us not to fear, but to have faith in the one who has sustained us. Father, in a very special way, we thank and praise you for this vast land of India its people, governments, authorities, and leaders. May the wisdom of God might be granted to each one to deal with the situation at a time like this. Father, we pray for the suffering people around us with very many problems, and we do not know where to go except to pour our hearts before the throne of grace and throw this, this morning we seek your face, for your grace will continue to abound and surround and equip that each moment that we might be able to experience the merciful hand of God in all that is said, done, and Lord, uh, Father, given to us. We pray for our congregation in a very special way. Lord, thank you for sustaining each one. It is a joy that overwhelms our lives with gladness to declare what a mighty God we serve in the Lord Jesus Christ. Continue to protect each one from the children to the senior citizens. May each one be granted the grace and strength to cope up with each day experience. In the glorious name of Jesus, we pray for the ministry of this local assembly. Father, the response has been good, and we want to thank and praise you for the people who have committed and dedicated to continue this uh, streaming 
through the digital ministry. We also remember and pray in a very special way that you will continue to watch over us and help us to realize the merciful, gracious, loving hand of God surrounding us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we continue to pray for varied other ministries, including the ministry at Nagamangla, which is not doing very well. But we seek your faith that you would give us the wisdom to handle the situation in which that we might be able to bring glory and honor to your holy name. Lord, we are a needy people. Our needs are varied many, and they are very peculiar. Father, you have done great and wonderful things. We have seen prayer being answered, miracles taking place for whom we have been praying so that this morning we could jointly with faith can come and touch the hem of your garment not only for our lives, our families, our extended family of fellow believers and claim the wonderful promise of God. Father, we continue to pray in the name of Jesus for the many suffering people. Lord, people, Lord, to, uh, to enlist the students and the teachers, Father, the youths, the young adults, and especially the hosts of working class who are having very difficult times with their employers. We pray for your special grace and anointing and favor might be granted. We are here to praise you. Lift our hearts and sing. We are here to say, Lord, we love you. We have no one else. You are the Lord, the Savior, the Redeemer. We pray in the name of Jesus that you will continue to bless our people as they step into a new year this week. We remember John Bosco, Ken Shaker, Sandeep David Rao, Sindhu Clement, as they enter into a new year in their life, celebrating their birthday. Lord, we do unite our hearts along with them to rejoice. Watch over them. Lead them, make them a greater blessing in this year and the years to come. We also remember and pray for Mr. and Mrs. Sandeep David Rao in a very special way. Thank you for this talented couple who have been dedicating, dedicating their time and the blessing the ministry in so many ways. We pray that your presence would go before as they experience the Lord's gracious hand of blessing leading them into another year. Truly, you have been their refuge, their fortress, their rock, a pleasant help in all situations. And so, Lord, we bless them in Jesus' name. We pray this morning as we celebrate the communion, the Lord's communion. Quicken our hearts to recognize the Lord had paid the price in order to, for, that, for us to enjoy the freedom that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ to his, through his death, burial, and the resurrection. Father, we pray for your living word as the word of God is ministered by your servant in a very special way that you will speak to each one of our hearts. Father, that we might be able to humble ourselves and say, Lord, speak for your servant heareth. And that we might be able to experience the Lord's touch and the Lord's word penetrating deep into our souls into our hearts to give us a new meaning and a blessed hope in the days to come. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answer our prayers. Continue to move amongst us as we wait upon you. Minister to us in the way in which it pleases you. We entirely depend upon the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit of God who indwells and quickens us to rejoice and to be glad. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. Be with us the rest of the service. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen.
The Bible reading for today is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 16 to 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 16 to 21. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we, we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all take part of the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifice uh, participate in the altar? Do I mean then that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to, particip to be participants and demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Here ends the Bible reading. Play praise be to God. Good morning. It's my joy and privilege to share the word of God to you this morning. Indeed, it is such a joyful privilege all of us we have to worship the risen Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. I greet you all in his name, first of all. My beloved friends, as we live in this society, we always interact with negotiables and non-negotiables. Non-negotiables are always essentials. They sustain things. But on the other side, wherever non-negotiables, negotiables also will exist along with it. Often, negotiables will take up the place of non-negotiables at the cost of seizing the non-negotiables sooner or later. It happens even among the Christians and in the churches. One of the key reasons for this hazard happening among Christians and churches is because of the lack of preeminence given to the Word of God. This morning, I have a message to share with you how a particular church because of lack of preeminence to the word of God, how did they go behind? How did they made how did they make non-negotiables as negotiables and made some of the negotiables as non-negotiables? And that's what my message. Non-negotiables and negotiables in the partaking of the bread and wine. You know, from various activities of the church I narrow down to one particular aspect and that is partaking of the bread and wine. Of course we cannot understand this glorious act that God had ordained for us unless we read 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and 11. And indeed you cannot understand what the Lord has, Spirit has for us unless you know the context of Corinth in which Paul had planted the church and for what he had planted the church, what purpose he had planted the church. I want you to go with me a short journey. Just think about Corinth City, the time of Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul days, though Corinth was a Grecian city, it had become, it was made to be one of the colonies of Rome. As a result of that, the population had a major segment of Greeks and second to that was Romans and then Asians and then Jews, indeed unbelieving Jews. So it was such a cosmopolitan city. You know, to that city, God had led Apostle Paul to go in. And indeed, he had come there when he was doing his second mission journey. It was probably around 51 AD. 
the narration you could read uh, in book of Acts chapter 18. And he had stayed there for minimum 18 months and maximum up to 24 months. Not only he had planted a good church, but also he planted a sustainable church. And then he had entrusted the responsibility of the church into the hands of the people. And he departed as the Spirit led him. Indeed, he went back to his hometown. But when he left, he, his desire was the church that he had planted should influence the city. As a result of the cosmopolitan atmosphere, ungodly people, in the city, fractions among the people was existing. I'm a Greek, I'm a Roman, I'm an Asian, and so on. I'm rich, I'm poor. I'm a philosopher. I'm an educated, you are an illiterate. You know, such kind of fractions. And immorality, you know, Greeks and Romans, for them, immorality was part of their breath. So the immorality was unfortunately recognized by the society. So sin was not considered a sin. What Bible says sin and society says, no, it's not sin. And indeed, because of the origin of Romans and Greeks, and indeed as well Asians, idolatry became very prominent. So Corinth city, the people are indulged in fractions and immoralities and idolatry. And their God sent Apostle Paul to plant a church in order to reach them. And, and, and Paul's desire was that the church must reach the city and win the people. But what happened is very interesting thing. After he had planted, you know, we will, when you read 1 uh, Corinthians, the epistle which he had written a little later, uh, he, he mentions in chapter 2 the purpose for which the church was planted very categorically. The purpose of the church you could see, number one, the believers and their faith must rest in the power of God. That was his ultimate purpose, one of the purposes. Number two, the believers should know and show the crucified Jesus to the people. Number three, the believers must accumulate, earn the mind of Christ. These are all the three things he said. This is what this church should be. And after he had gone back to his hometown, he took up his third mission trip and he came uh, to Ephesus. And he was in Ephesus. When he was in Ephesus, he had good access to get to know what was happening in the Corinth. Because both the cities were commercial cities, interaction of people was very common. So one of the women folks that he had contact early, Chloe, Chloe's household, we don't know whether they're relatives or children or servants, we don't know. The word of God says Chloe's household, which means authentic information, came through them to Apostle Paul concerning the status of the church. What's the status of the church? The status of the church is Paul intended to have the church to influence the city, but the city influenced the church. God, Paul wanted the, the aroma of Jesus to go in. Contrary to expectation, the aroma of fraction, the aroma of immorality, the aroma of idolatry had come into the church in Corinth, my beloved friends. That was such sad thing had happened. So when he came to know about it, when he was in the city of Ephesus, Paul, he writes the first Corinthian, the epistle. What was the purpose of this epistle? The purpose of this epistle is to point out their problems and to counsel them. He had two means of uh, communication. One was uh, some of the people, those who had come and made complaint, like Chloe, 
And the other one, some of the people in Corinth, since they had come to Ephesus quite often and had the privilege of meeting uh, Paul in person, they also had made some comments about the church. So having all those information he got, he writes now the first epistle, and that is what in our hand we have, first epistle written to the church in Corinth. There are various uh, issues and challenges that he's handling in that. I'm not going to get into all of them, but I'm going to focus on the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, or the breaking of bread and wine this morning. Now, what I said, I just I bring a kind of a thesis. The thesis is Paul's purpose of planting this church in Corinth. Paul wanted a church to be planted in order to reach the community. So that's the challenge. For that challenge, the requirements that are needed for the believers. Number one, as he said, believers' faith must rest in the power of God to know and show the crucified Jesus and to have the mind of Christ. These are the qualifying requirements, non-negotiable requirements for the church to reach the challenge. The challenge is Greeks, Romans, Asians, and Jews indulged in philosophy, in idolatry, in immorality, in factions. Ha. Huh. <clears throat> Let's go and see Paul's concern he exhibits in chapter 1, uh, sorry, chapter 11, 1 Corinthians, verse 17. He says, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse you come, he says. <clears throat> you come for worse, he says. You know, what he's saying is this, you come together, you fellowship together, you break the bread and take part in the cup together. What's the purpose? The purpose is that by doing all this, that you should move on from better to best. But what's happening? Better to worse. In, in what sense? In the sense of reaching out the city current. You are called to reach that city. That's your challenge. In that challenge, you must become best. Instead of becoming best, unfortunate, you become worse. So that was Paul's concern, my beloved friends. And then the next one that we see here is Paul's prime complaint. Prime complaint. Uh, we see that in verse 27. Verse 27, he says, so beautifully, you come and take part in the breaking of the bread and wine in unworthy manner, in unworthy manner. That is a very strong concept he wants to bring before them to think about. You come and take part, but in unworthy manner. Then what's worthy manner? You know, he lists out very categorically here. Number one, he says, is among you, there are divisions. There are divisions. You know, what are the divisions he's talking about? Division number one, as he already pointed out in this epistle, chapter 1, verse 12. Even in this section, chapter 11 also he's talking about it. And chapter 10 also he's talking about it. But categorically, in chapter 1, verse 12, if you read, you would see that. There are some people, they keep telling, we are of Paul. And there are some people, they say, we are of Apollos. And some people, they were saying, we are of Cephas. And some of the people, even they said, we are of Jesus. In fact, Paul or Apollos or Cephas or Jesus are not the architects of these fractions. He, 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 they did not do this at all. They did not do this at all. These divisions are caused by the people. Why? Primarily, their ego. Primarily, their ego. How does that ego come in? And how that ego gets control over them? Because absence of 
the mind of Christ, God's word. When God's word is not indwelling in us, always you remember the sinful deeds will become very active. As long as the word of God has control over us, the sin nature and sinful deeds will be controlled. And that's the first thing he says. You have divisions among you. You have the spirit of saying, I am of Paul, of Apollos, of Cephas, of Jesus. And you all come together and put your hands together. And you call that communion. That was first complaint. The second complaint he says is, sin is among you. In chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians verses 1 and 2. There we read, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. Sexual immorality, immorality among you and you are the ones who come and touch the bread and wine. So that's the second complaint he says. Sin among you. Then what, what church was doing? Church was closing the eyes. How? Because what was being practiced earlier outside, that outside practice had crept inside. When it had come inside, then that gained the prominence and got certified. And nobody finds it as sin. And so boldly, courageously, the one who has involvement in sin, he keeps his hand in that bread and wine. And that was his second complaint he makes. The third one he speaks is about idolatry. You know, that is being well said in chapter 10, which we will be seeing a little later. You know, categorically to find that, you have to go back to chapter 8 and read verses 7 and 8. Okay, 8, 7 and 8, what was the problem? The problem was some of the believers in the church who had influence of uh, idols earlier, very strong. Now they had become part of the church and still they have influence but not as much as it used to be. But influence of idols are there as a result the God of the universe, the real true God and the concepts of idols are put mixed together. And they come and put their hands. So this is Paul's complaint. You are unworthy to take part in this table because in your heart you have divisive spirit in your body you have been practicing sin in your soul there is no total submission to God Yahweh so divisive theology divisive thoughts and above all sinful life with that you come and you touch the bread so you are taking in unworthy manner after saying that now he goes and and he tells about the uh, some of his comments what are the comments that he gives chapter 11 verse 20 he says when you come together it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. You have, to, you have to carefully analyze what is being said here. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Which means, you do not have mind of what it is actually. You come and eat thinking that it is Lord's Supper, but that's not what Lord's Supper means. You eat, you are taking part in Lord's Supper, but you do not know what is Lord's Supper. So that is his complaint. You know, why, why does he speak about it? You know, we should know the historical development of this practice in, uh, in the church of, uh, into the church of Corinth. We all know in book of Exodus chapter 12, we read about the introduction of the Feast of Unleavened Bread or the Paschal meal that we read there. And Moses was instructing to his people that once they reached the promised land, they should adhere to the unleavened Feast of Unleavened Bread and Paschal meal. So he says that it should be followed. 
And that was one of the ordinances, I would even say, given to the people of Israel. My beloved friends, if you are thorough with the Old Testament, you could see till the time of Samuel, that was adhered. After Samuel, till uh, the time of uh, Hezekiah, we don't see that was, that was adhered strictly. I don't see strictly adhered. Then after that we see Hushaya who comes and then he takes up the charge and then again it was celebrated, my beloved friends. So all that I want to say is, why did Moses say that you should have this Feast of Unleavened Bread or Paschal Meal? For one reason, and that is to remember. It's a memorial to remember the deliverance that God had given to the people of Israel from the hands of Egypt. And then when we come to Luke's Gospel chapter 22, verses 7 to 20, which is a long passage, I don't think I would be able to read everything to you. You know, when you see there, there are two events put together led by the Lord Jesus. If you read verses 7 to 18, Jesus being a Jew who had regular Passover meal with his disciples, now even here before his death, he was taking his Passover meal with them. And that was in conjunction with Exodus chapter 12, because Jesus was a Jew. And then when you come to verses 19 and onward, 19 and 20, there you see the Lord Jesus, he shifts under the gear. It's a new gear he, he brings there. But that gear does not mean altogether new. It has some kind of impact of what he had celebrated already Passover. Verse 20, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper. That, uh, sorry, you have to forgive me. Verse uh, uh, 19 and 20, if you read, and Jesus, now he introduces a new covenant and order to the disciples who are called to reach all the nations. So now again, in verse 19, he takes the bread and he takes the wine and he celebrates and he breaks it and he gives to them and says, you know, take it and this is my broken body, this is my shed blood and so on. We all know about it. So there are two things here, comes one after the other. One is the Paschal meal, the other one is the new institution of the Lord Jesus. How can I say this is a new institution? Paschal lamb was out of the blood shed by the lamb. And here it is the blood of the Lord Jesus. And that's the flesh of the lamb. And here it is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the Lord intentionally, Jesus uses the word, this is a new covenant. You know, the word new and covenant, they distinguish that this is something God ordains here. The Lord Jesus ordains here. So how could we take it? What Jesus meant here is this. As God delivered the people of Israel during the time of Moses by the shed blood of the Lamb, in the same manner, now the shed blood of the Lamb of God, me, God the Son, through my shed blood, you have deliverance. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. So this is what Jesus says. And that part is so important for us, my beloved friends. But when you come to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 17 to 22, you know what you would be reading here, the Corinthians, they combine these two together. They combine these two together. So they go and have great meal, fun. And no order, no discipline, no godliness. Mechanically, ritually, they celebrated the feast of unleavened bread. And along with that, whatever Jesus said, they also tried to incorporate into that. But the people, those who came and recklessly took part in the Feast of Tabernacle, they are the people taking part in the new ordination uh, that God had made. The new covenant, my beloved friends. And that's why 
chapter 11, verses 20 till 21, if you read, his complaint we see. You have no honor. You, you, have, you have not given adequate honor as you partake in the bread and the wine, he says. And then one more comment he makes in verse 22. In 22, what he says is, by taking an unworthy manner in the table of the Lord, you despise the church. You despise the church. You know, the word despise here, which means you give less credit to the church in the eyes of the people. You, you, don't, you don't consider this is divine instituted concept. You made it human. You made it religion. This is much more than all. You despise the church. What is church? When you think of a church, whether this denomination or that denomination, whether a big church or small church, what is church? Church is a portrayal of the relationship between the Lord Jesus and the saints, the bride and the bridegroom. What is church? Church is a, a combination, collection of families. Then who are the families? The families are the symbolic evidences and, and expressions of that church. Husband and wife of a family, of a church, when they go out and live together, they exhibit, they show the relationship between God, the Lord Jesus, and the saints, my beloved friends. And Paul says, you despise the church by touching in unworthy manner. Now he begins to give exhortation. This is what the, the, the heart of my message, my beloved friends. I do not have time to read every, every passage that I'm going to tell you. I expect you to read carefully. If you go back and read chapter 10, 1 Corinthians, and verses 16 to 21, he makes almost all the criticisms I made now. In the same manner, after he made criticism in chapter 10, verses 16 to 21, and finally he says, you do not have recognition of this is Lord's table. You know, in the New Testament, here is the only place in verse 21, the word Lord's table is used. And this is intentional usage of Apostle Paul. Who was Apostle Paul? He was a Pharisee. He was a scholar. He, he knew Old Testament. And now he says this is Lord's table. When he says that this is Lord's table, he certainly, you know, he had the concept of Lord's table in the Old Testament to great extent. In book of Malachi we read, the complaint was given by the prophet. What was it? You have polluted the table of the Lord. At the end of the journey of a saint, where we will reach, we will reach a table of the Lord. Psalm 23 confirms that. So when, when he says here, the Lord's table, you know, I just I want to read quickly from uh, my version here. 19, what do I imply then? The food offered to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, imply that. What pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God? I do not want you to be participants of demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and cup of the demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. You know, all that he says is, when you have divisive spirit, when you are indulging in immorality, when you have connections with idols, and still you want to stretch your hand with this bread and wine, all that he says is, how could that be? You have connections with demons, cups and table. How could you come here? This is Lord's table. This is Lord's plan. This is Lord's son. This is Lord shed blood, and this belongs to only the people of God. Only the people of God. So, 10, 16 to 21, Paul's thesis is, this is Lord's table. 
Then when you go to chapter 11, verse 23, breaking of the bread and partaking in the cup is an ordinance given by Jesus Christ. For I received, Paul says in verse 23, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. I received from the Lord. We don't know how did he receive. Did he receive through a vision? Could be. There is no detail about it. Did he receive that through other apostles? No idea. No idea. All that he says is, I received from the Lord. It could even be his own uh, intuition led by the Spirit. We don't know. All that he says is, I received from the Lord. So this is Lord's ordinance. That you have to think of. When you look at the broken bread and the cup there, this is ordinance made by Lord. When you come to verses 24 and 25, he says this, he writes in this way, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant uh, in my blood. Do this often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You know, there are two things here he brings before us. One is, Thankfully, you have to celebrate because when the Lord Jesus took the cup, he thanked. You know, the word thanking here is what the Greek word Eucharist. And that's why many, many churches, they call this as Eucharist. So Eucharist, which means giving thanks. So when you come and stand before the table, you must be thankful. Thankful not because God blessed your education or blessed you blessed in your job. No. Thank you, Lord. I was such a sinner. I was a man of this world. God, you, you cleansed me, you forgave me, you made me a new man. And spirit is indwelling in me. You have chosen me. Thank you, Lord. You know, that is the primary spirit mood that you should have. And then you also have to think about the word new covenant of Jesus. What does it mean, new covenant? The new covenant here is to tell us that there is a new community God is opening. There was a covenant he made with Abraham. In that covenant, he said that through your seed, the nations will be blessed. How that nations will be blessed when that covenant and promise was made with people of Israel? Here is the answer. Jesus in the line of Judah. Now he is the lamb. His blood was shed. Now the covenant is made. What does it mean that covenant here? The covenant here is God has initiated this and God has done. What is he going to do? He's going to cleanse you. He will keep cleansing you. He will keep your soul, spirit and body clean before the Lord. And that is what the new covenant is. Here it means, my beloved friends. So think of that new covenant that Jesus made and thankfully celebrate. Come before the table of the Lord with hearts of thanksgiving because Jesus died on the cross and made a new covenant. His body was broken, his blood was shed, and so you will stand before the Lord one day blamelessly. And verse 26, when you come, he says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know, uh, when shall we gather? This is one of the questions that we have. You know, all that Bible says is, for as often as you. So as many times as you could, that's what my interpretation here. Okay, what is very important here? Very important here is when you come, you proclaim something. What is that you proclaim? You proclaim the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross for the world and for your own self. And that was the reason in the, during the apostolic days, the believers, they used to gather every day. And every day they would celebrate that. In their homes they celebrate that. Why? To remember every day. Jesus died on the cross. And to tell the world, Jesus died on the cross for me. He cleansed me. He's cleansing me. I'm his child. He's my father. So it was a proclamation. 
As you come and stretch your hand on this, remember not only with thanksgiving heart, but also accepting the challenge that you have a proclamation ministry. If you are a child of God, when you come and stretch your hand on it, you must acknowledge that you have a proclamation ministry proclaiming that Jesus died on the cross for the world. And 27 to 32 is a warning. What is it warning? The warning is unworthy participants. What does it mean? If you don't realize, recognize all these important four non-negotiables which I brought before you. If you do not recognize these four non-negotiables, you are unworthy. My beloved friends, as we are going to take part in the Lord's table today, we should now distinguish what are the negotiables and non-negotiables. The interpretation of the word of God and the traditions they have brought number of questions before us. What is it? Where should we observe it? Who should administer it? How often we should do it? Why should we do it? And so many interpretations. You know, I'm not saying these things are incorrect. All that I want to say is most of them are negotiables. The non-negotiables are very important unless a child of God distinguishes these are all non-negotiables. I'm committed to this. I live for this. Then all that he would do will become in vain, my beloved friends. What does partaking in the bread and wine mean to us? Some of you might think this is a routine one to adhere as part of my church discipline. And some of you might think, no, no, it disqualifies me to be a spiritual person. I must take part in that. And some of you might say this identifies me with the Christian religion. There is a possibility. And some of you might say, this is my church culture. My parents did it, so I'm doing it. Well, if you have one of them, all of them, I'm not going to say anything against it. But all these are, again, negotiables. Then what is that non-negotiable I want to bring before you? When you think of the Lord's table, the bread and wine that is before you. It is something related to your faith. There are two things that must be taking place as we take part. One is we should reflect a faith. We should reflect a faith. And then the other one is we should reaffirm a faith. Now what do I mean reflecting our faith? Reflecting our faith, with, which means I should think this is God-ordained purpose. I am a redeemed person. I should reflect that redemptive work of God in me. When I say I am a redeemed person, which means I don't belong to myself. I don't belong to this world. I don't belong to anybody, anything. I belong to my Lord Jesus. And that's the reflection, number one. Number two, you must reflect your thanksgiving because graciously you are saved. It's a gracious act. You reflect that. This is gracious act. I need to be thankful to him. And the third one is you should reflect the covenantal relationship. This is my new covenant I make for you. So we are the covenant partners. Jesus is the covenant maker. We are his partners. So what? He is God. He is holy. I am his child. I am a saint. Again, the word saint comes from the same root word holy. He is holy. I am holy. And then I reaffirm it as I live on this earth. Number one, let me show crucified Christ in me. It's painful, but purposeful. I Reaffirm. Ah, this is my life. I have mind of Christ. If I have mind of Christ, no room for divisions. If I have mind of Christ, no room for secret sins. If I have mind of Christ, there is no room for any fleshly thoughts and ideas. The third one is, my faith must rest upon the power of God. Whatever comes, I will stand for the Lord Jesus. 
So my beloved friends, there are two important things I want to bring before you. Reflecting your faith and reaffirming your faith as you come and take part in this table of the Lord. Let us look to him in prayer. God, we want to thank you for the precious word you have brought before us this morning. God, pray that you would keep, Lord, kindling our hearts and spirits that we would understand what is the table of the Lord. Help us, Father, as we come and take part in this table that we might always, Lord, submit ourselves to your authority. Reflect and reaffirm our faith in the church and outside the church. In Jesus' name, Amen. At last I lay down I will cling to the old ragged cross And extend it someday for a crown In the old ragged cross Stained with blood Suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I cherish the old ragged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will play. Before we celebrate the table of the Lord, I would like to read a portion from the book of Hebrews. The word of God will enlighten you as you stretch your hands on this symbols of the broken body and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is chapter 9, book of Hebrews, verses 11 and 2. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that were already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place, once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences 
from acts that led to death so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of the new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this new covenant symbolically set before us. God, we thank you because you have redeemed us. You cleansed our conscience. You have adopted us into your divine family. And above all, Father, you have sealed us with your Holy Spirit. So we are your belonging. And you are a savior. You are a Lord. You are a master. All that happened on the cross on the day that you died for us, for the world. As you set an ordination. Lord, now we follow that. You said that we should do this in remembrance of what you have done on the cross. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this joy of remembering who you are and what you have done to us. As we take part in this table, God, we pray that Holy Spirit may, Lord, lead us to keep remembering for what you died and why you died on the cross. For the world. Lord, pray that Holy Spirit may make us to recognize your death on the cross for us, for our own self. And so that, Lord, we may continue to walk in that progressive Christ-likeness in us. And also, Lord, we pray that Holy Spirit may kindle us to, to recognize the proclamation ministry that we have in this world, in this city. We thank you once again. We give you praise, glory, and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The Lord Jesus, the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. People, those who are confident of being washed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus, and people, those who are confident of their new life in Christ Jesus, I welcome you to come and take part in this holy table ordained by God himself. Let us all take part in this table which symbolizes before us the broken body of the Lord Jesus.
This is the symbolic expression of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus. Let us take part in unity. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. What a joy, O oh God. You remembered us. And because of our sinfulness, you made such awesome plan, the plan of salvation, which has been, Lord, progressing right now on this earth. Jesus came and he died on the cross. We celebrate it now. Yes, Father, we are the partakers of his body and his blood. Not his little body, not his little blood. But the implication, what we see here, is so important for us. We are partakers of the kingdom. We are the partakers of your mission. We are the partakers of your body. God, we thank you for this joy of taking part in this table. As we go, Lord, we ask your blessings upon us. We ask your strength upon us. And above all, Lord, we want the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit in us. We want the word that we heard may continue to echo in us, Lord. And so that we can stand firmly not like the people in the church of Corinth who turned to be apostates, abomination, in spite they set their hands on the table. God, we ask you your very special strength on us as we enter into this world and remain as the salt and the light of the earth. We give you thanks, praise, glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation. Purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting. Looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us for now and for evermore. Amen.